All right, good afternoon. 415, I see. So I will welcome Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixit, up to our dais here. Good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon. So we are looking at uh, items K, or at least starting at K1 tonight, uh, which is textbooks. Okay, uh, the first item, contract number RGA 110-12, technology education, grades nine through 12. This is a contract modification to provide continued acquisition of student textbooks, teacher materials, and uh, to replace and update current instructional materials for grades nine through 12 technology education courses, including but not limited to foundations of engineering, engineering principles and applications, and engineering technology GT. Approval is requested to increase spending authority by $75,000, bringing revised total contract spending authority to $175,000 with one awarded vendor approved by the board in uh, October 2011. All right, questions? Ms. Gauzy. Good afternoon, Mr. Saris. For this contract, I see that we have the original spending authority was $100,000 over a 12-year contract, is that correct? Uh, correct. And was this initially a competitive or a non-competitive procurement? This is a procurement under uh, Article 7-106 and Board Policy 6002. So non-competitive. Uh, it is based on uh, best value is the terminology used by the state for curriculum purchases. Okay, great, thank you. And so it appears that we've spent um, over, just slightly, over $100,000 in um, less than the 12-year period. So I'm curious, what is the reasoning behind the increase, the 75% increase in this contract? Um, the expansion of our CTE program primarily, but I'll let uh, Ms. Shea answer further. Hi, Hi um, how are you? So um, in the last several years, we've been spending about an average of $15,000 a year. And some of that is because of an increased enrollment and some our CTE classes. Um, last year we had over 1,600 students enrolled, which is great. Fantastic. And yes. so we used that um, $15,000 per year as our estimation. So going forward for the next five years is where we got that increased request of 75. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Item K2 is public notice social studies supplemental resources. Yes, this is a contract modification to provide for continued purchase of materials of instruction. The document-based question project for the Office of Social Studies and Secondary Schools, the DBQ project provides students with primary source materials to improve document analysis and writing skills. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by 150,000, bringing revised total contract spending authority to 300,000 with the uh, awarded vendor approved by the board February 2018. Mr. Saris or Ms. Shea, could you just provide us with a little one bullet point about what DBQ project means or does? Sure. So DBQ stands for document-based questioning, and so it is part of our social studies courses in which students review primary and secondary sources um, to form the basis of an argument. And at the end of um, reviewing those primary and secondary sources, they cite evidence as part of their disciplinary literacies to construct an argument based on the documents that they reviewed. Okay, great, thank you. Questions, Ms. Han. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, good evening. Hi. Um, hi, is this contract for the purchase of print materials or digital materials? So the DBQ both? materials that we purchased are print, and so um, this um, expansion we purchased, essentially the first spending authority was our large purchase, so we purchased for all middle and high schools print materials. Um, the increase is to allow schools that choose to purchase additional sets. This was actually a good news in that they were popular, and some of our teachers wanted permission and authority to be able to purchase additional sets, so they were print. DBQ does offer online, but this is particularly um, print materials to supplement what we already have in place. 
Okay, out of curiosity, I know we're moving toward a digital curriculum. Is there a rationale behind why print is preferred in this case over digital? Sure. So initially, when we first brought it forward, it was to supplement in middle school. Um, our middle school social studies courses have access to Discovery Tech Book. So this was about balancing and having that blended environment to have a print source. Um, another reason that we went with print initially was the shared inquiry piece of it. So we have groups of students analyzing documents together as part of a shared inquiry. And we thought print supported that. Um, in this instance, it doesn't mean moving forward that we wouldn't expand and, and look at it. But in this particular case, we wanted to have blended resources and have students looking at um, primary and secondary sources this way. So is it an accurate statement to say we're moving more towards a blended environment where it's appropriate versus fully digital? Because it seems like we're, we're kind of making that shift now away from all digital all the time to best meet the needs of learners where they are and what materials are the most appropriate. And feedback that I've gotten from the community is in certain cases a preference for print materials. I'm hearing that from teachers and from sure. parents as well. Is that your So my director from my superintendent has been blended. Um, we are certainly not advocating no more books. You will never hear me ever say, <laughs> say that. And, um, and so I think blended is the way that we are moving. And so we look um, at choosing materials for two reasons. So sometimes it's at the level of the student choice. Some students do read better one way or another, and so we want to be able to have that flexibility to support the needs of students. Um, but then also in the environment to show students that um, there is a different skill set. And so we have to teach our 21st century learners to be able to navigate text presented both in print and digital. Um, so it's our obligation to provide a learning environment that supports both. But it also depends on what field and course Correct. subject we're and talking the about and Absolutely. the project at stake here. So I mean, we're extrapolating a lot out of one contract, but let's just be mindful about how much we do. No, but this is helpful, so thank you for yep. responding to this. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, so in reading the summary, the contract summary, because we don't have the contract here, um, it says that it provides for the cost of ongoing professional development for social studies teachers and then also allows the individual schools to purchase their additional supplies. So I was curious how much of this is professional development and is the professional development in person, in school, how is that being accomplished in the time frame that it's Sure, so the breakdown is approximately $30,000 for the PD, $120,000 for materials, so that's the basic divide. Um, the $30,000 professional development is over multiple years. It is in person. Um, it is two days for that initial training, and then there is the option for ongoing um, support or coaching support. And I think my mic shut. <laughs> what is the option? The, the um, so I was saying the, um, the option for that ongoing support in school. So the initial training is a two-day training in person. And so um, we um, want to be able to continue that for new teachers, new to social studies, or to continue to deepen that practice. Um, but then they do also offer um, coaching support in schools with um, departments that would seek that. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Yep. Item K3 is Open Educational Resources, Content, and Curation. Uh, this is a new cooperative contract f uh, for access to NetTracker, an online database and digital content software for all schools. Approval is requested for a seven-month contract with the option for four one-year extensions with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $510,000. Questions? Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so from the summary we received, I understand that this tool really curates OERs and provides a database for easier access to those and search. Is there additional value that this provides? Because those those resources are, I see Mr. Imbriali coming forward. Um, looking to know if there's additional um, value provided because these OERs are open um, licensing for use at no fee. So Correct. I'd like to understand better what the um, expenses or the value so associated what, with what this So what NetTracker does is bring all those, all that OER content 
into one curation tool mm -hmm. and then allows for easy searching, searching by standards, searching by subject area, aligned to curriculum. So it allows for our teachers to be able to find the material they need to provide to their students much easier than just searching a whole series of separate OER locations where content might reside. On the, on the flip end, it also helps curriculum writers as we're looking for open educational resources to easily find those resources that may be aligned to subject area or standard. And does it allow for searching by state-specific standards? It does. It does. Is that a custom option, or are there any other districts in the state using it currently? Uh, this product, I believe, is used by a number of different school districts in the state. I don't know which ones they are. It's part of, actually, the MDK-12 consortium, which is a purchasing agency that's run through the uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. Right. I see that it's a cooperative agreement. It is, yes. Do you know off chance if Anne Arundel or Howard County are using that as part of their Go Open initiative with the Department of Ed? I'm not sure, but I could certainly find out for you. Okay. Do you know how that initiative relates to use of this? Um, the Department of Ed's initiative provides a toolkit for those districts looking to go open and some access to digital content resources. So I'm curious how this supports or aligns with that initiative and what BCPS's plans are in terms of that so, initiative. So we also participate in that initiative, the Go Open initiative. We're not a signed member, but we're participating through the Maryland State Department of Education's Office of Instructional Technology. And so we are participating in all of those conversations around what's happening with the uh, Go Open resources. Many of those resources are part of the Net Tracker resources because all those open educational resources have to be curated somewhere. Sure. Um, what are the benefits of being a side member, and can you speak to why we are not one, if that offers well, additional value? So participating in the Go Open mm -hmm. movement is all about understanding how to use those open educational resources. And so since we have a curation tool that we're currently using and subscribe to a number of different services that provide digital content, well, we participate by listening and making sure that we're hearing what the conversation is around the Go Open movement. I'm asking because of the level of commitment that it shows by participating in that movement as a member um, to use the resources if we're going to invest half a million dollars into this tool, what is our um, commitment to making full use of this? Well, and one of those measures is participation in that Go Open movement. So I was curious to see how other districts who are participating in that level, what is our commitment? to using this and what costs of development or commercial licensing will be offset by approving this? So we've used this tool since 2008. Mm -hmm. So we've used the Net Tracker tool and been a part of uh, open educational resources movement, movement since 2008. So the product has been a part of our ecosystem uh, for a number of years um, and it gets heavy use. Uh, the product is already built into a number of our curriculum um, maps, so teachers are having access through NetTracker to align to open educational resources. It's a part of what we offer right now. Are, then we should have some good data. Are we tracking the return on this investment in terms of costs are being offset for development of our own content um, resources or commercial content? To There should be an offset here if we're... Mm -hmm. Um, investing in access to an open repository of resources, then one would expect us to be spending less on commercial resources and in-house development or commercial development, because that's one of the, the main advantages, right, of using open educational resources is that, that savings and that collaboration um, amongst educators who are developing these to make them available to districts. So is that something we're tracking? Well, we're always auditing all of our digital resources, just like we would audit any of our materials we have. So we're looking at what resources we have, how much those resources are being used, what's being used, by what grade levels, by what grade bands, and making sure that we're making the right decisions uh, for our students and for our teachers to access to provide the instruction they need in the classroom. For NetTracker as a particular tool, um, we had uh, over 70,000 individual student accesses last year, so 70,000 different students here in the Baltimore County Public Schools used or went into NetTracker to do searches, and those searches were well over 400,000. Have we replaced any commercial content with open educational resources avail available through NetTracker? Well, we've had this pro product since 2008, so it was one of the very first products that we had in our ecosystem when it came to open educational resources. So we've been involved in the open educational resources movement well before there was, for example, the Go Open movement. Okay, but that doesn't answer my question in terms of our spending on commercial resources as an, I would expect to see an offset 
in what we're spending on those commercial resources as they're replaced by open resources. Can you speak to that? Well, this resource was there prior. So any resources that we're purchasing to layer on top of that are resources that we deem necessary through our academic offices or the need we have in the system for teaching and learning. So we're still seeing gaps in what's available through a resource such as NetTracker, and is that the first, first stop before we look at other paid resources in order to provide? So one of the challenges with open educational resources is often alignment. So NetTracker sits on top as a curation tool, and it, it does it the best it can to align to standards and to make sure it meets the needs through a, a standard set. Would, that could be the Maryland standards, it might be NGSS. And then what has to happen then is oftentimes those open educational resources are separate elements. They could be video elements, they could be something that's a text-based element, it, it could be interactive. All of that has to fit together as a package too. So when we think of other products that we have, a lot of times those packages have wraparound services that provide embedded assessment, embedded video that aligns to, to content or reading material. So open educational resources have a tremendous amount of value. It's about ensuring we're looking at the right pieces um, in our ecosystem and for our curriculum maps to make sure it aligns. So what you're saying is that it's not apples to apples. It's not. They don't provide exactly the same services trying to compare one to the other and say this can occupy in its entirety the space of the other would be not an accurate analysis. They're, they're free for a reason. And it's our responsibility to make sure we look at those, the curation tool to help provide the alignment afterwards. All right. I still have Other questions? questions. Well, let me ask if other board members have questions. All right, Ms. Ann. Um, where are these OER source that are available through NetTracker, or is it the expanse of the web, or do they filter the sources that they, they make available through the database? They do filter the sources. So th they have a team of, uh, content experts, whatever you would like to call them, and then they, they look at that content and then align that content. So are they also We always have the opportunity to, to look at that content to make sure it's aligned how we would align it. So are they also then vetting the content as they align them to the state standards? That's correct. And they're using their own proprietary rubric or tool to do so? To evaluate the quality of the resources that they make available through their, their tool. Is there a quality assurance component included? The, the net tracker the company Novation has their own quality assurance control system in place. And then, like I had mentioned, we can choose to agree with that quality assurance or not when, the, when that piece of content comes forward to us. So where does the responsibility lie um, in evaluating that quality, or is it shared between um, the company you said, Nova sorry. The company's Novation. Novation and the product is NetTracker. Where is the re ultimate responsibility for that quality? Are we talking about a library of pre-vetted resources and we're paying for that quality vetting or does that rely on our, our staff to perform those quality checks? So it's pre-vetted and a great way to look at it is a library of resources. Mm -hmm. On top of that though, we do work with NetTracker and with our academic offices to say this group of open educational resources works exceptionally well in whatever that curriculum might be, because we've worked with NetTracker and our academic offices to align that curriculum. So then a teacher going into our learning management system would be presented with resources that we vetted that are in NetTracker that have already been vetted once. So teachers have access to a, lim a, a filtered set that have been pre-vetted. They have access to both. Curriculum. Teachers have access to the full suite of resources that are in NetTracker, mm -hmm. and then they have access to resources that have been pre-vetted through our academic offices, working with our teachers through curriculum writing. Great. Thank you. Ms. Coulson. I have a few other questions before we finish. I'll are they in the same train, or can we take a break and come back to you at the end? They're on the same topic. Okay, go ahead. Topic. Um, so ISTE recommends several um, no-cost OER repositories. Um, have those been looked at, and what are the advantages of NetTracker over some of those other repositories? Well, and I don't have the list in front of me, but there's several others that seem to do the same thing. Maybe their search isn't as robust, but they curate um, OERs and have been recommended by ISTE. So I'm curious if other options were considered here. You said we've been using this since 2008, but new products come on the market all the time. Um, how does this compare? What is the advantage of this over f free curation services that also offer databases, such as Mer Merlot being one, although they focus on higher ed, mm -hmm. they have quite an extensive library of resources. 
So the one thing that's really important to understand about a product like NetTracker is in our ecosystem, it has a direct LTI connection. So um, there is a seamless connection between both products. For example, in this case, it would be Schoology, our learning management system, and NetTracker. So the, the interface and the seamless access to that digital content um, is uh, exceptional and makes the user experience that much easier. That includes teachers, that includes students, and that includes parents. Thank you. And I'm okay for now. I Ms. Gossie? A few others. Thank you. So you were talking about how we've been utilizing that tracker in the past, um, but in our summary, our one page summary here, it says that it's a new cooperative contract for access of net tracker online database and digital content software for all schools. Um, and it's saying, okay, cooperative contracts, so it's off of Montgomery County Public Schools. So how were we purchasing or utilizing that tracker in the past? We had purchased um, a bundle of products uh, through the consortium before, and a number of those have dropped out of our, of our compilations. So, uh, we have three remaining products that we're using, uh, that we plan to use through that consortium. This is one of them. Okay, so we had to get a new, a new source of, of a contract. And a new spending authority, and uh, we decided to break it up rather than to purchase a package of items. Okay, and is this on the MSDE you mentioned? Um, MSDE list of researched instructional materials? Don't they keep a list of instructional materials that they recommend? It's, it's part of the MDK-12 consortium list of recommended products. Okay. And that involves all, all 24 of the local education agencies are part of that consortium, have represent, representation who sit on that consortium, vet the products, and then Montgomery County is the fiscal agent. Okay, I see, thank you. And then when you're saying that um, 70,000 unique students had 400,000 hits, how is that monitored? Is that individual, I mean, do you actually know what individual students are doing? And is that information being sent back to NetTracker? It, NetTracker has signed our data sharing agreement. So we, we have an agreement with NetTracker. So, um, so there's information that pa passes back and forth through the LTI connection that allows us to ensure that we know who's using the product. This, this connects back to the conversation. If, if I was, I wouldn't be sitting here if the usage numbers were very low. There'd be no reason to have the product. So it's about looking at the usage numbers, making sure that we're tracking what people are, what students, teachers are doing with the product to ensure that it meets our needs. And um, which version of the, student data privacy agreement did they sign? Did they sign the latest one or they've signed an old one? Let me just check with Jim. One. They've signed the newest one. The newest one, okay, that's great, thank you very much. Um, along those lines, is there a list that the board can receive of software um, that is not up to the most current version of our student data privacy agreement? I think that's pretty uh, far afield of what we're talking about right now, Ms. Causey. Um, it is exactly what we're talking about right now, our student data privacy. We're talking about we a net tracker contract. We're not talking about yes. doing an audit on the data sharing arrangements that we have with all contractors. It's not appropriate for building contracts. You can bring it up at the board meeting, in my opinion. It's not an audit. I'm just asking, is there a list? Is it a short list? Is it a we're talking about student data privacy. I think it's important. Ms. Hen can also kind of weigh in on this. That is a topic. Um, it's a topic for safety and technology. Steering committee, for instance, I know that that is something that 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 uh, steering committee has been um, talking about for some it time. It is, and perhaps on the contract summaries we receive as contracts come to the board for approval, we could receive that information as a data point would be helpful too. We can talk that over with the staff, yeah. Well, the, my understanding is the last safety and technology meeting was in March, May? April. Yeah. April? We were due for and so when is the next one? I mean, it's one thing to push off getting the information that we're requesting right here to a committee meeting that might actually happen or one that's still so, being so pushed So just so down that we're clear, um, and uh, again, the, the safety and technology steering committee meetings will, are on schedule and they are 
they're being scheduled and will be held regularly as as they have been. Keep in mind that our um, data sharing agreement is, is more stringent than that of the state. Also, our um, school system has um, a, a tool where, and especially on our Growing Up Digital website, where we share with parents exactly what data is being shared and how it's being shared, the tools, the icons, all of that, um, we are being recognized for. We are a leader in the state in that in that case. The, all of those topics have come up through the da sa uh, Safety and Technology Steering Committee, and certainly this is one topic that has come up as well in terms of um, who has signed the newest version and who still has yet to sign. We know that we have hundreds and hundreds of contracts, so that would take some time for us to gather and for, for us to uh, curate and get back to you. There's no um, reason why we can't bring that to the Safety and Technology Steering Committee, but it is going to take us some time to gather all of that information. Well, hopefully it's something that wouldn't take a long time so that we would understand that our students are having their data protected at the highest level. But keep in I mind, though, that, that even under the old um, data, I'm sorry to interrupt process. you, just uh, keep in mind, and I think this point was made before, even under the um, previous data sharing agreement, again, all of our uh, contracts have been under a level of data sharing agreement. Again, the most recent data sharing agreement is the most stringent that we know of in the state of Maryland. However, students' um, privacy and, and data has always been protected. So this notion that whether or not the new one has been signed or not and that our kids aren't protected, that isn't true. What's true is that they're under some, all of our contracts are under um, some level of agreement, and the, the most recent level is the most stringent level. Thank you, Ms. White. I Cognizant of our that. time. I appreciate that comment, um, because the, the point, my point is that the most stringent one is the one that we should be applying on a routine, regular basis, and even I've made the point in the past that we should go back to those other contracts and bring everybody up to the most stringent uh, standards that we have currently. Thank you. Our next item is K-4, which is Reading Apprenticeship Professional Development. Uh, this is a new contract under cooperative administration of programs through a memorandum of understanding to provide for disciplinary literacy professional development to secondary school teachers. Approval is requested for a three-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $650,000. Thanks. Questions? It's Causey. Hi, Ms. Shea. Hi. So um, if you could just specify what is the funding source in terms of the grants? Yep. So this is a part of our um, Baltimore County application for the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. Mm -hmm. um, so I gave a lengthy presentation at Curriculum Committee that you can <laughs> go back and, and read. But this was um, part of our efforts to apply for and receive. We've um, been awarded $1.75 million um, in that Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. So that um, will be the funding used for this particular contract. Thank you very much. Sure. Our next item is K-5, dental simulation equipment. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide dental simulation lab stations to support the dental assistant magnet program at Overly High School. Approval is requested for a one-time purchase and contract spending authority of $110,000. OK, questions? Our next item is K-6, Professional Development and Coaching Program. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide professional development and coaching to assistant principals. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $300,000. Okay. Questions? Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Sears. I was just uh, wondering what method and manner is the professional development and the location of where our um, assistant principals will be trained? 
I'll ask uh, I can help with that, Dr. George. Bird. Good, good afternoon. How are you? Um, the trainer meets in a lab space. Uh, she works in large group, small group, and individual settings. The cycle usually starts with large group where they learn how to use the actual software product. And then as they begin the schedule, scheduling progress, uh, process, it gets smaller and smaller until they're working on individual school schedules where she provides individual coaching and support. Have we uh, used this provider before? We have. Okay. And for what length of time? I, I'm going to guess it's been about four years now she's been working with us. She's a retired assistant principal with great expertise in high school and middle school scheduling. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next item is K7, cable and wiring materials. Uh, this is a new cooperative contract for cabling and wiring materials and services for the Department of Information Technology. Approval is requested for a three-year contract with 26 recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $1.75 million. And this is a uh, contract uh, initiated by the state of Maryland. Questions? Our next contract is K-8, which is food products. Yes, this is uh, one of our, uh, this is a contract modification for consent to the assignment of this contract from Advanced Pierre Foods to the Hillshire brand company. There are 32 other award bidders on the original contract approved in May 2016. This is the result of an acquisition between yes. the companies, right? Okay. Questions? K-9 is Medicaid billing system. This is a new competitively bid contract for web-based Medicaid billing system software for the Office of Third Party Billing. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with the option for a five-year extension with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $1,266,635. And you received four complete bids here? Yes, we did. Okay. Questions? Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, according to the description, this will replace the current homegrown or home built system that no longer meets technology standards. I'm curious what Correct. those standards are. Well, uh, it's a system that was developed in 1994, and it was last upgraded in 2004. So it's still running on an old Windows operating system um, and has to be maintained on a separate server and this will move to a, uh, a hosted uh, system that's uh, maintained and supported uh, by the vendor. So is this part of an overall st strategy or goal to move to hosted environments or um, I don't think so SAS based I, I can't really comment on that uh, and perhaps uh, you know mr. Vukov or somebody with more IT knowledge could comment but this is strictly because we can no longer operate on on the system that we have and we can't we were unable to find a vendor or a an individual who could support and maintain this sure. this 24 year old system so I our understand. option it's was to go to go out and f and find a company with the experience in this particular field so it's I understand so and appreciate that it's antiquated my question is why now in terms of the reason why is, is supportability in. it's on file maker pro oh. <clears throat> which you can tell is a very more. old system um, the cost to upgrade that the cost to even move that to the cloud and the support that's required back end it's just too expensive so now's the time to go ahead and upgrade the system and move it over to a cloud-based service are there other needs it, it is running and i know we have a lot of needs throughout the system um, can you speak to why this in particular is a priority right um, now again we, we have nobody on staff to support the system so if it goes down we are looking at potentially losing the ability to track certain types of students a uh, certain type of data that we will not be able to recover after a while. So the ability to support it as driving. Yes. Would data security also be? 
Correct, driving. because this is isolated system. It's based upon old uh, logins that are not tied to Active Directory, whereas the new system will be tied directly into Active Directory. We can go ahead and set up different permission rights based upon the user types. The ability to encrypt, I imagine, yes, would be stronger yes, as well. And uh, are there any cost savings associated with this or the chance to improve efficiencies? Well, this is one of the few areas where BCPS has generates revenue independently. Um, services primarily, special education students and uh, low-income students. So we bill about 175,000 so individual services each year take in over $7 million. So it's, it's very critical to our special ed program and to our revenue stream that uh, we make sure that this is functioning in a proper manner. Okay. This is funded through grants. And, and it's totally and funded the by the third party billing system. So uh, originally we had thought we might be able to save some money by hiring a consultant to just work with the system we had, but we found very uh, limited Thanks. options. Okay. And the support is also included in yes. this? Because web based support is included. Web based support is included by, um, by Civic the Group. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Item K10 is containerized uh, refuse and recycling. Uh, this is a contract modification for consent to the assignment of this contract from Enviro Solutions uh, to Waste Management Maryland Incorporated. It's a corporate uh, merger. Yes, and this was originally a competitively bid contract, um, and waste management is honoring, of course, the original pricing that was a result of that RFP. Okay, questions? K11 deals with grass seed and fertilizer and field treatment. And this is a contract modification for consent to the assignment of this contract from Crop Production Services to Nutrien AG Solutions. There are two other bidders on the award approved by the board August 2018, no expenditures to date. Okay. Ms. Causey. Um, I was making notes when we went past ARA-203-19 cable and wiring. I just had a couple of quick questions. If sure. Go back to that, please. Are there any additional questions on K11? Okay, we'll go back to item seven, I think, cable and wiring materials. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to understand the, um, it's a cooperative contract. So did the cooperative contract already include all of the recommended yes. vendors? Right. The okay. state made this award to the 26 recommended vendors and we will just be using them <clears throat> based on whichever is available to provide that particular service at the bid price at that at, based on our needs. And um, what was the date that the state of Maryland um, started that contract? I um, don't know if I have that. But. Um, I would have to bring that back to you. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, so we still have, we still have spending authority left, or you you filled in the spending authority for the contract. Yeah, this is a the expenditures this is for the contract new, that's expiring. Right. So okay. this is a new uh, contract with new spending with this 1.75 <clears throat> excuse me million dollar spending authority, which is based on what we've spent to date under the previous contract, which was also the state contract. Okay, and it says as needed, uh, but with this value of funding the million and 750,000, are there already known schools or facilities that'll be utilizing this? Well, and all new construction, uh, renovations, additions, or new s replacement schools would be uh, the subject of the capital expenditures which make up the majority um, of the program expenses. 
Okay. <coughs> and um, what does it mean to do cabling outside of the facilities? Is that to bring it I'm in from let the- I'm Mr. Vukov answer that. <coughs> Going back to your prior question, as far as existing projects, yes, we do have some known projects. Um, Hereford High School was actually a recipient of fiber optic cabling that we brought from um, I-83 through the community over to the school. So anything that we convert from the uh, current provider for wide area network, which is Comcast, mm -hmm. over to our county services, uh, fiber, utilizes this contract. So again, if we're working in a state highway right away, we have to use a state contractor, a KCI, Pfeiffer, one of those companies. The other thing about the outside plant is anything that's outside the shell of the building. So if we penetrate the building, we classify it as outside plant. It can be either underground or it can be aerial, but that's outside. Anything to do with inside the building is called inside plant. Okay, so the fiber, is that the dark fiber network from the Baltimore County It can be County a dark government? fiber, it can be you know, fiber that we light. Um, it, it's really for us, it's just whatever fiber is put in place and then we can light it or we can go ahead and utilize it for future years. We also use this for uh, connecting our relocatables at our schools. In case we have one that's older, um, has uh, copper connections, and that can handle our current bandwidth, we'll actually go ahead and use this contract, uh, come out with you know, a few different companies, get an estimate from each one, and then go ahead and replace that copper with fiber. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. All right, members of the committee, do I have a motion to recommend to the full board for its approval items K1 through K11? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. It's unanimous. Uh, this school is targeted for completion for August 2021. Our team has worked very closely with Dr. Basil McComas, our chief academic officer. While we have a lot of experience with elementary school and high school construction, this is the first middle school we are designing uh, after a long, long time. And it just so happens that Dr. Uh, Basil McComas is extremely experienced in the functioning of middle school. So we were fortunate to work closely with her. And I'm not going to talk about the design, I'll leave it for the team. Uh, but I would like to introduce you the in-house team is headed by Mike Archbold, who's our architect, and the project manager is Doug Mullins. He's right here someplace, please. Uh, the architect that we have hired is uh, Mosley Architect. They have done a lot of middle schools, and uh, one of the partners, principals of the company, Mr. Bill Brown, will be making the presentation. We have been given very short amount of time <laughs> To, to, to move it fast, so we're requesting you save your questions at the end of the presentation, and we'll answer all those questions. With that, um, Bill, why don't thank you start? You. Well, uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to come and present uh, the uh, new Northeast Area Middle School tonight. Um, our agenda uh, includes some general information, uh, our project goals, uh, some ongoing value engineering measures we're doing, project location, uh, site uh, conditions, building organization, which I think will be interested in. We're gonna share some renderings and 3D animations, a uh, little bit of the project um, schedule overview, uh, and then we'll take some questions. Um, you're familiar with the site. Uh, it's the uh, Nottingham Park site um, in the uh, eastern part of the county. Um, I think that one of the important things here was that we were tasked with uh, development of a new middle school prototype, and through that there was a uh, sort of a directive that it be student-centered and instruction drives facilities. Uh, so we worked with the curriculum uh, committee with a number of uh, charrettes uh, to find out what the vision of this um, uh, middle school was. We brought our expertise and shared a lot of design precedents. Um, the uh, enrollment is targeted for 1410. Um, there's some regional programs which include a, a magnet, Academy of Health Sciences, and a regional special ed program. Uh, the project goals 
uh, also included creating collaborative expanded learning areas, which we'll get into in the, in, the, in the floor plans, I think, but it was all to support 21st century learning techniques. Um, they were co uh, collaborative areas, extended learning areas, which we'll, we'll follow through and, and talk about in the floor plans. Um, we're targeting achieving a LEED Silver rating um, we're with a real focus on what we call uh, integrative design, which focuses on energy efficiency. Um, the unique features of the uh, project uh, were based around creating three team learning communities for each grade. Um, and what we'll show you later is that grades can either be um, configured by wing or by floor level. Um, we have a compact um, footprint. There you, still oh. there you go. Oh, thank you. A compact footprint, um, the building conf configuration uh, allows us a lot of flexibility. We've standardized the classrooms. Um, uh, there's a, a really unique multi-use stage for vocal music, um, dance, and performances that has theatrical lighting, wing space, curtain system, um, and telescopic uh, seating, and you'll uh, see some images of later, and some outdoor rooftop classroom spaces. Um, our value engineering uh, efforts have also included uh, uh, geotechnical investigations uh, so that we can find the best place to site the building. Um, we also uh, adapt the building to the site condition. So what you'll see are three wings, but they step along with the site. This allows us to save money and reduce structural um, impacts. Uh, the academic wings are structural steel frame. Um, in the architectural side, we've in, looked at simplifying the building footprint, limiting the use of uh, concrete masonry units, and standardizing a lot of the spaces and uh, components. Um, within the uh, vicinity of the Northeast uh, Area Middle School are, um, come up here, uh, the, the Northeast Area Elementary School, Ridge Road site, uh, the Shady Spring Elementary School, Orms Middle School, uh, the Glenmar Middle School, and Vic Victory Villa. Is that in Orms Elementary School? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, uh, is, as far as uh, adjacent uh, middle schools, there is Middle River Middle School, and also the Community College of Baltimore County Essex uh, campus. Moving to the actual site, uh, which was identified as a Nottingham uh, um, uh, Park site, it is bounded by uh, King Avenue, uh, Stapleford Road, uh, Red Hill Way, um, and also I-95. Um, it includes a parcel of 5.3 acres from Baltimore County, and the total project combined site is 35. Point Five acres. As we show the development of the site, uh, orienting you with King Avenue, Stapleford Road, uh, and Red Hill Way, um, the main entry is in alignment with a, uh, a collection, pedestrian collection uh, feature, and then the bus loop is on the east side. Um, getting a little closer in to sort of uh, see how the, the site works. Uh, there's King Avenue, Stapleford Road, um, and then we have two, two ways to get into the parking lot. Uh, we have a main parking lot, which uh, will include the drop-off area, and what you can see here is that uh, cars will uh, queue up and uh, 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 drop off along there, culminating in the main entry. Um, pedestrian access is not cro we, we've minimized crossing of any drive aisles for safety. Um, and then the bus loop, uh, buses will come down Stapleford Road, um, enter the site, uh, and then we can do unloading as shown in this configuration and then the loading would be um, as the buses are uh, stacked in appropriate ways. Then that would be the uh, bus loop entry for the students. Uh, we also have a service area with some secondary parking. The site amenities include a ball field, um, tennis court, uh, paved court, uh, a play court, um, 
We also have uh, rooftop classrooms that I had mentioned. We'll show you those in the plan. Uh, we have an outdoor learning commons that can be used um, as well. And then uh, as we're developing it, we're establishing some stormwater management um, facilities. So this is the floor plan. And the concept of the building was that we would have uh, a definition between the public and active side and then the academic and quiet uh, side of the building. What you see are three uh, uh, um, communities on the uh, right-hand side of the plan. Main entry and bus loop entry to orient you as the site plan showed. We got a uh, we've got the secure entry vestibule and lobby uh, sequence, uh, guidance, health suite, um, administration. Centrally located is the learning commons, uh, the gymnasium, the, the, I'm sorry, the uh, cafeteria and uh, commons uh, for the stage and vocal dance, um, the music classrooms, uh, the art classroom, and you'll see that uh, as we go up and through the floors, the art classroom is uh, positioned on the northern side for northern light um, for the uh, uh, art uh, facilities. The gymnasium, uh, and then the uh, Baltimore County Recreation and Parks Regional Office uh, that also has a, uh, a multi-purpose shared, uh, two multi-purpose rooms shared with uh, parks, or Rex and Park. Um, the typical grade level uh, team area is made up of three uh, typical grade classrooms for a core uh, curriculum, uh, a special ed or ESOL uh, space per team, uh, a science classroom, and then each of each of these uh, space uh, configurations and communities are uh, situated around a collaborative learning area. Um, the classrooms are paired to have an extended learning area that can be used by either class and uh, visually monitored. Then we have support spaces like uh, um, storage, uh, facility, uh, faculty lounge, uh, stairs, and then. On the second floor, uh, very similar to the first floor, we'll have the same team configurations. So there's um, a, a way to, that each of these are standardized. And you'll see the collaborative learning areas, um, the extended learning areas, the support spaces. And then the unique parts of shared space uh, is the art classroom, uh, world language. Um, we've got some flex classroom. Um, and another world language. And then one of the uh, focuses of the school is the health sciences lab, which we've centrally located on the second floor uh, near some vertical circulation, and then the uh, technology um, lab. We also have two um, out outdoor classrooms that are uh, part of a green roof configuration. These are accessible by all programs throughout the building so that they can be multifunctional from an uh, academic uh, perspective. The third floor is very similar um, in configuration for the team communities. I'll go through that. And then on this level, we do have a, a third art classroom uh, world language. Um, and here we have the professional development room and also a maker space that are divis divisible by a, a folding partition so that we can open that up. So if there's a, a really school-wide program um, that they want to use, they can use that space. Then we have some additional flex classrooms and world language. So the intent is that all of these kinds of spaces are able to be uh, utilized um, by all teams while the team areas are really to keep the, the community close together. As I said, that uh, the ability to configure uh, the grades either vertically by each of those wings or horizontally by floor level gives a lot of um, opportunity to, uh, to approach that. Right now we're, cons we're sort of envisioning it as being vertical. Uh, I did mention the unique uh, features of the uh, stage and the, the dining commons. This, this gives you the um, image of the attributes of it as it seats for uh, a lunch. Uh, we would be able to accommodate about uh, 500 students. 
Um, with the dashed lines of the stage, we could then uh, reconfigure it. Uh, we've provided for um, telescoping seating so that you could then seat a little bit over 500 uh, patrons to watch a performance. Uh, this is another picture of, of that type of um, facility uh, and that will be included. Some, some exterior renderings. Uh, this is uh, sharing the main entry. You see there's a wayfinding device to bring people in from the uh, parking lots, a pedestrian path, which also allows for visual uh, su uh, passive uh, surveillance uh, from the admin area of who's coming towards the building. Uh, this is uh, looking at the academic wings on the bus loop side um, and then coming around uh, seeing the, um, uh, the dining commons uh, from the uh, far right there. Another view which also shows a little bit of that exterior learning commons. Now what I'd like to show uh, is a, a little video here and this will allow you to sort of get a sense of how the building um, is configured this is looking back towards the bus loop and each of the different uh, uh, academic wings. We've stepped each of these down again, as I said before, to uh, sort of respect the terrain. Um, so we're not moving a lot of earth. Um, you can see now the, the relationship between the service lane around the back uh, also for uh, services. Um, as you enter the site, uh, coming into the bus loop, I'm uh, not the bus loop, the, uh, the student drop-off, I'm sorry, uh, you, you would come towards the front and this gives you a very identifiable uh, wayfinding device to know where the entry is. Um, we pull up and then uh, students would be dropped off to uh, come to the entry. Uh, the next portion of the yeah, it's, uh, this is the bus loop. Um, so you, you would come up, this is coming into the bus loop on the eastern side, and you see that what we've done is uh, use a real crisp and modern architecture. Um, we've standardized the windows, uh, kept all of the materials pretty simple, um, and th this is another wayfinding de uh, device for the bus loop uh, entry and come around the side. Now this is a, a great opportunity that we were able to create a, a court area that allows for some outside use. Uh, we could, as you see on the left there, that's outside of the dining commons, or if there's a um, function going on or a, a, a a performance, you could use that uh, for sort of pre-function uh, area. But this is also an extension of the learning commons so that you can have different groups of, of students come out into the, uh, the court area. So here's some, this is an interior animation of a representative um, team configuration area. We'd have graphics to identify each of the ones a little bit differently, again for wayfinding. Um, as you come into the uh, the community, you would have some facilities on the side, but all of the classrooms then are uh, grouped around a collaborative learning area. Um, it would be uh, provided with flexible furniture, movable furniture, reconfigurable uh, furniture technology, so that you could either have small groups out there or bring the team out there um, to have some presentations. This is a typical uh, classroom, uh, also, uh, showing the extended learning area so that there's a good visual connection between the extended learning area that's shared by the two uh, paired classrooms and you can also see outside into the collaborative area. Uh, this is uh, looking uh, from the lobby out to the main entry. Uh, this is the uh, dining commons in its uh, setup for uh, lunch and then an example of what it would look like uh, once you were uh, in, in a performance mode with the, the uh, the theatrical uh, accoutrements of the stage. Um, our our uh, proposed schedule is we started design in September 2017. Uh, we anticipate a contract construction award of May uh, of 2019 with a notice to proceed in June of 2019 and then construction complete in July of 2021. 
And with that, I thank you very much. Um, we're really happy with where, where we are, um, and we'll take questions. Are the questions of Mr. Brown or the team? <coughs> right next to you. Yes, sir. So thank you for that presentation. Just a couple of questions. One, on the parking lots, you talked about that main parking lot, and then next to it, I guess, was an ancillary parking lot, and there seemed to be then a walking space um, dividing the two. Is it going to be pretty evident that cars are not to cross that other pavement area? Because it seems like that is <laughs> pretty flawed if, if we allow that to happen. Yeah, that is a, a raised um, sidewalk that's got curb. It's not a mountable curb. Okay. Um, you know, we've got uh, landscaping on one side. We haven't finally done the landscaping. So I think we'll have some definitive visual clues that that is not where you drive from one to the other. And will it be clear then that not both parking lots are created equally in as much as one should be used by staff, administrators, and so forth, whereas the other should be public? And the, I'm sure we'll, we'll develop some signage because the bus, I mean, I can say it again, the, uh, the drop-off, the student drop-off is in that one. So right. the be buses clear, then yeah. are not in the next one over, but the, the one after that, so that might be confusing for orientation purposes. So I just, I would encourage us to be clear in the way that we signage this There will thing. be some wayfinding signage on the perimeter at, at those different entrances. Okay. And then you also uh, mentioned a big emphasis on public space, and I think obviously we have public space as it relates to recs and parks and that sort of thing, but are we envisioning an additional opportunity to bring the community into this building in a way in which we haven't done so in the past? And maybe that's a question for staff as opposed to our, our architects. Um, with the multi-use stage cafeteria space is intended to give us the flexibility that we normally don't have that kind of seating capacity or stage performance capabilities. So that multi-use stage can be used for classroom space for the dance and also for a second vocal music classroom. Um, and then it can be converted so that it can be opened up as the stage with appropriate wings and the stage is sized appropriate to be able to have the full orchestra or band from the school perform at the space so that you give that multi-use flexible space to the cafeteria that would usually only be. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking things like, I saw those flex classrooms, for example, is that an opportunity for us to provide additional adult education services? And Dr. Boswell, I'm looking at you. Yes, so good evening, everyone. Um, certainly, Mr. Stewart, I think our ability, uh, for example, to have a community school model, um, and you know, as you're familiar with, our community school um, facilitator orchestrates um, resources in the community to come into a school and provide resources. So rather that's academic opportunities for parents, or if that's um, tutoring resources for students or even uh, social health welfare uh, resources, all of that could easily uh, be worked into the uh, space availability depending upon the time of day. Okay, all right, great. And last question was related to those three-story structures. I noticed on some of the renderings that it looked like, although the classrooms themselves were abutting the edge of that building, that there are only windows on one side of it as opposed to kind of wrapping around on the other 90-degree side. Um, yeah. and. It that is uh, intentional because what we've done is we've set it up so that we have daylighting coming in on one side, we have the connection to the extended learning areas on the inside corridor side wall with glass looking into the collaborative side, mm -hmm. and then we need some teaching walls. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, classrooms are uh, wall space is at a real premium. So we were very intentional about the placement of windows versus connection to the collaborative area and the extended learning areas, and then using the two um, uh, sidewalls right. as... Makes sense. Um, so we're not concerned, uh, overly concerned at least, that the access or ability to see what's going on in that common space will be too distracting or unduly distracting. For our students there'll, there'll also be you know, some blind uh, or some window treatment that, that we can control that. Okay. Especially, you know, if there's a, any other um, safety right, considerations. Yeah. Sure, makes sense. Mr. Yulfelder. Uh, what's the projected cost? Microphone. <coughs> what's the projected cost? We don't like to talk about cost, but it's in excess of hundred. It's it's in excess of hundred million dollars for the pr project cost. Uh, and we own the land. Yes. Okay. Um, 
That does not include the cost of land. Okay. My other question is, um, I noticed there are provision for two ball diamonds. Is that enough for middle school? You want to handle that question, two <laughs> ball diamonds. Is there any site left for any other? Um, we've really maximized the, uh, the site, and I think that uh, we, we were very in, intentional about creating a, a way to have uh, overlays of uh, other field configurations on top of that. Um, it may look like a big site, but it, it is pretty tight for all of the, uh, the facilities we're trying to get on there. I just want to add something to it. We have worked closely with Department of Recreation and Park to make sure that they do not have any long range issues with just having two ball diamonds and they have been okay. So the option we really had to uh, look at the uh, other part of the parking lot, the drop off, and if we take that off, then there are some security issues with the student safety and security issues. So it, that's the, uh, the compromise. Well, the reason is is because um, if you go on the uh, I-95 side, yeah. there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of wooded area, and I'm, I, I mean, I, I, it, I see more ball diamonds at elementary schools than I do at a middle school which I, based on the area, I would suspect, you know, has a big need for ball diamonds. And I as just, we develop the site, um, the county will require us to have a uh, tree conservation area, and we, we've already sort of worked a little bit into it, but I think we can mitigate that uh, problem with, you know, some other uh, things that we're doing on site, but they would not allow us to clear that and, and one other thing, did I miss, or are, is there elevators in the building? Yes, <clears throat> there is one elevator in the building, and we have uh, an additional uh, air alternate for one and two more elevators. Okay. So de depending on the bid that we get, uh, we'll try to get more than one elevator. Does one so elevator meet the needs of a middle school? It meets, it, 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 it meets building code and all the middle school that we have built and that they have mm -hmm. built had one elevator, but in our conversation with the superintendent, she was very clear that we needed more than one elevator. And we have included that as an ad alternate. So unless the bid comes in way higher than what the funding is, uh, we do intend to provide at least one more elevator. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Just to dovetail with Mr. Ufelder, where do you have the elevator in this plan? You want to show that? Bear with me. There we go. Um, if you look at the uh, center uh, wing, you'll see that there's a stair on the bottom uh, off of the main, main street corridor. Right above that is the elevator. So we centrally located it uh, along that, uh, the corridor. And our idea for the add alternates is to add one in each of the, um, the other community uh, pieces uh, near the stairs. Okay, thank you. Um, also, in looking at the bus loop, and I hear Mr. Ufelder's concerns about sports, and I um, have a, as a focus recreational fitness for, for our students. I believe that's very important as we try and support the whole child's development. Um, but I also see trying to balance all of the needs that we have, and I do know bus loops are an issue with safety, and this looks like a very well-constructed one. And also, I mean, I, we've seen a variety of them, but I do want to point out that there was an incident at a middle school last academic year where a student became ill right before dismissal. And their bus loop and parking lot combination and no parking on the road, you know, no side street availability, they had to move all the buses, bring in an ambulance, the whole school, you know, dismissal was uh, affected by 40 minutes um, with, you know, congestion clogging up in the neighborhood. So, and I've also heard from other middle schools um, that have a, the older bus style loop where they pulled in and then backed up. You know, there's issues with um, mainly the cars not paying enough attention. But in any case, we need to try and mitigate and, and uh, avoid any opportunity for um, 
accidents. So I do think you're trying to work very hard to balance the needs of safety um, with recreational needs. So um, I can appreciate that. And I am grateful uh, for trying to get in more elevators because we have also heard from schools that have over a thousand students that it's very difficult um, and it takes away instruction time from students that have some um, need for using the elevator. Um, the other thing related to safety is um, in the views of the classrooms, um, the video that you provided, mm -hmm. there's a lot of glass. What is the thought process in terms of safety with so much glass in terms of a lockdown situation? I mean, I can understand the blinds coming down blocking visuals, but there's no protection from even a person with the hammer coming through that glass. So I, I guess I'm curious what the thought process is around that. Well, one of the things we've done with the team pods themselves is they've been developed so that the pod actually has the ability to be secured as the pod um, as you enter from the, the Main Street hallway. So there is a um, additional security opportunity for us to be able to close that pod down and create security for that individual team pod. Um, and then when uh, within the pod itself, um, we are looking at some different opportunities with security shutters that would help be able to close those um, windows off from the collaborative zone area, but still be able to be open during the normal um, function of the classroom, but be able to close to secure um, and create the opportunity. We've also looked at where those doors are in relationship to the classroom and being able to follow the ALICE protocol that security is using. And the location that we've done is actually giving us a better opportunity to split those places where the students will congregate while sheltering in place. It gives them, we're spreading them out rather than congregating in one single corner. Um, and we also have the ability to move from classroom to classroom with the extended learning area. So that gives us another flexible component to that as well. Is it the sort of things like fire doors where if an alarm goes off, those doors will automatically close? Mm -hmm. Or does a teacher need to run out and? Uh, we have the, the ability to, and we're working with safety and security to determine which doors would be able to be, if it's um, alarmed, that those doors would close. Right now, it's an intention that those team doors would close automatically in, in a panic event. Okay, that's very good to hear. Um, There's other compartments in the, in the school that can also be compartmentalized to slow down an intruder into the space, but we didn't really talk about that because uh, we don't like to publicize those kinds of things in, in the meetings. Okay, so. thank you. Um, and the other thing, just to dovetail with Mr. Stewart's questions about the space, uh, one of the things that I was thinking to some of our schools, especially the larger schools, student needs pantry, additional community health spaces. So what I heard in your response to Mr. Stewart is that there is some flexibility within the spacing to add extra services for the community. Would you say yes, Mr. Dixit, or? Well, the the ad specs were developed with the construction, with the curriculum and instruction people, and we had representatives from the uh, different departments. So all of the spaces that are identified here are in compliance with the ad spec. The community spaces are mainly a gym uh, and, and the cafetorium and the other spaces. Uh, as you can see, the budget is um, limited and there are so many other needs, so we have tried to meet all as many needs as we can. And I don't know if I answered your question. I'll just add to that. Yeah. Just with any school that we have, that collaboration with the principal and their team in the community, that, that will be no different here, Ms. Causey, so, and Ms. Mr. Stewart. This school is gonna have ample space, but yeah. we don't necessarily have identified space for the community in those school shelves. That's something that the principals and the community work out. So it's plenty of space there. 
we're a little bit evasive because we don't want to say that that's X space and Y space because that's something that the principal and their teams will work out with the community upon availability and need as those activities come up. The addition of the new space as it relates to the auditorium that comes out, that's new, that we're trying something to gain some space there. The uh, park and rec space, being able to cut off that space during after hours so we don't have the situation where we have it. Some of our schools are going to have it. So the answer is yes. We just don't, we haven't identified those spaces yet. And that's something that will be done school-based, not so much from this. Thank you very much. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Nick, directing your attention to slide uh, 12, uh, which is where you had referenced the uh, pedestrian walkway between the bifurcated parking areas. Um, you may, if your schedule permits, just take a, a drive by um, our layout at uh, Carver because you'll see a, a bifurcated parking scenario with the elevated curb and sidewalk areas. Um, and as someone who thought originally you could perhaps go from one to the other, I learned very quickly that you can't. <laughs> uh, and I even tried the other way around, and that, 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 that didn't work either. Um, so you may, you may consider that. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for this exciting, uh, if expensive, uh, as, it, as it no doubt will be, uh, project for our sixth district. Directing your attention to slide 10, uh, which shows the um, uh, sort of the road map and the concentric circles. Uh, where Philadelphia Road comes down and intersects with, uh, if you will, the lower uh, dotted or uh, dashed blue uh, circle. Uh, that's actually the uh, location of another of our middle schools, and that's Golden Ring Middle School. Isn't that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, um, that school, the Golden Ring Middle School, um, that school opened in my goodness, maybe 1928, 1929? It, it was before our time. Uh, <laughs> uh, certainly before mine. Um, uh, and when one goes to that school and walks the school, uh, one sees the different additions that were made to it. And there are multiple levels and, and stairs, et cetera, in that building. Um, and I, I think the, the superintendent uh, uh, had, had a good suggestion with regard to a second elevator at, uh, at, at the new school uh, site. I was also um, pretty excited to hear about the northern exposure for the uh, lighting into the art room. Um, there is a very um, uh, well-regarded art program at our Golden Ring Middle School. Camille Gibson, in fact, was just recognized, but you all know that because you all have seen the, the, um, uh, the press release that came out. Uh, and I think that's going to be just an astounding uh, facility for our students to, to do their art. I was also glad to hear that you all are, are, of course, in touch with our folks at Recreation and Parks. Um, when I was on the board in uh, Recreation and Parks and served uh, as chair uh, for our sixth district, this site, of course, uh, was, was also in, in uh, my district. And directing your attention to slide 11, which shows the current configuration of the site, uh, where the parking area is with the buildings, there is a, um, I think, a 90-foot diamond there. Um, my recollection is, in fact, that that diamond um, held a, a, a dedication ceremony, and it identifies um, one of our young county residents who played on that field with a, with a team. And unfortunately, he passed, but his, his love of the game was memorialized with the dedication of that field. Uh, with our current configuration, dependent upon the geotechnical study that's conducted, uh, contemplates this field now being um, part of, I guess, the, uh, the bus parking area, and I can certainly understand that, but perhaps in our conversations with Recreation and Parks, with one of the two fields, that ball fields that'll be created, there may be an opportunity there to continue that memorialization for that very, um, very um, memorable baseball player who played in, our, in one of our rec programs. We'll surely talk to them about it. Very good. Um, thank you ever so much. I very much appreciate you, you investing this time with us today. Other questions or comments? Thank you all. Thank we appreciate the presentation.